The sending of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is a glorious moment in salvation history. It's the moment the gospel is unleashed on the world. Sent forth with power to save. To save people from every nation under heaven. And so we have representatives of every nation under heaven in our passage. It's a glorious moment because now the salvation that was accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross and by his resurrection, that salvation is now going to go to the ends of the earth. And not just the message of it in the form of words, but those words are going to go out with mighty power. This power sent from God, the Holy Spirit. So from now on, many people are going to be brought to repentance and faith in Christ and thereby salvation in Christ by the Holy Spirit being sent out on this day that we commemorate today. It's going to happen first in Jerusalem. You see that in chapter 1, verse 8. It's going to happen first in Jerusalem, where they were. Then in Judea and Samaria, expanding outwards. And then to the end of the earth, chapter 1, verse 8. And this is accomplished by the risen ascended, glorified Lord Jesus Christ, receiving the promised Holy Spirit from the Father, you can see verse 33, and pouring out that Holy Spirit himself. And wherever he sends the Spirit, wherever he pours the Holy Spirit out amongst mankind, there is magnificent saving power. Now it's worth noting that the Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force. And I say that because some suppose that. Some think, uh, think it's a bit like Star Wars or something, this sort of impersonal force is what's going on with the Holy Spirit. Not at all, not at all. He's the third person of the Holy Trinity. Just turn back with me to Matthew chapter 28, page 835. And there, right at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus before he ascends, he gives the great commission. Verse 18, and Jesus came to them and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Do you see there's one name, the one triune name of God is the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity then is the one we're thinking about today. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. He understands the thoughts of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11. The Holy Spirit speaks. Acts chapter 28 verse 25. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Ephesians 4 verse 30. So the Holy Spirit is not some impersonal force. No, he's as much a person as the Father and the Son. And we know that the Son is a person. We see the Son throughout the pages of the Gospels, don't we? So the, the Holy Spirit is just as much a person as the Father and the Son. So what we celebrate today is the, is the sending of the divine third person of the Holy Trinity. The divine third person of God. He comes into the world with all the power of the Godhead with him because he is God or the power of God is his and so this is good news that we're thinking about today good news because it's the Holy Spirit's work to apply redemption the, the redemption that's accomplished by Christ in actual people's lives that the sending of the Holy Spirit is a piece of God's whole plan of salvation and it's actually the piece of God's plan of salvation where we see the plan bearing fruit, where we see the plan coming together, as it were, where we see the plan achieving the results for which it has all been planned. And on a huge scale, as intended by God. The, 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 um, the Feast of Pentecost was a Jewish feast. Some of you have been in our evening series on Leviticus, uh, through the book of Leviticus, and we've looked at this briefly. Um, in Leviticus chapter 23, the, 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 the Pentecost feast was a, was a Jewish harvest festival. And that is really apt. God didn't choose that randomly. 
God chose that deliberately and purposefully and significantly. Because the Holy Spirit was sent out on that harvest festival, the day of Pentecost, to cause the redeeming labors of Christ to bear fruit in actual people coming to salvation. Actual people coming to inherit eternal life and have their lives completely turned the right way up. And so in um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 6, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. In other words, the work that Jesus did on uh, the cross uh, at Calvary and the work that he did rising again and the work that he's still doing in heaven is bearing fruit now across the world in actual people's lives, being transformed, being utterly changed from depraved lifestyles of all sorts, turning to pursuing God, to pursuing holiness, to pursuing eternal life in Christ. Do you enjoy growing things? We're not very good at it as a family. Um, We're sort of growing strawberries by mistake. Can you believe it? Um, We we grew strawberries a few years ago in a grow bag, and and the grow bag's long gone, but the strawberry seeds are somehow still in the gravel that the grow bag was on, and so we've actually had a pretty good harvest the last few years. And right now, we can see fruit on our impossibly existing strawberry plants. There's fruit there. We're looking forward to it. We can see strawberries, actual strawberries. They're pretty green, but we can see strawberries. Now, in actual fact, the preparation for this stage, it has been happening for the last, I don't know how many months. Throughout the winter, there's been all sorts of things going on in those plants. And we're at the final stage now where the fruit is visible. That's what we're thinking. That's what we're dealing with in the day of Pentecost. The fruit is visible at this stage of God's plan of salvation. And so we see great numbers, in fact. A great harvest in the making at the day of Pentecost. And of course, it it begins like that, doesn't it? 120 believers, 120 disciples is how the day starts. It ends with 3,000 more being added. That's a growth rate of 2,500%. Now, there's actually great encouragement here because we see so little fruit in our own setting, in our own circumstances. We we sow the seed of the gospel. It goes out faithfully week by week. Conversations are had both in here, um, in various things that go on, and on the street with all sorts of members of the public. And we don't see much fruit from it, do we? But there's great encouragement in what we're thinking about this morning. Because we live in the era of fruit being produced. What is happening in our nation and across the West at this current time is abnormal. It's like there's a strawberry plant in our garden that refuses to produce fruit when all around there are others producing plenty of it. Now in actual fact I think we can see there are good reasons why God is withholding his hand of blessing on our nation and across the West at this time. We've so turned our back on the gospel, haven't we? I enjoy reading Puritan um, writings. And, and people from across the world look back at that particular time. It was a time of great blessing, and it's in our nation that we had it. And following that, we've had George Whitfield, uh, through him, God worked amazing things. He produced many fruit for Christ by the Holy Spirit working through his ministry. And yet, where are we today? Well, we're in a nation that's hardened against the gospel. No wonder we're not seeing much fruit at the moment. But there's encouragement because we are living in the Pentecost era. We're living in the days of God pouring out his spirit. Christ is still pouring out his spirit. This is the beginning of Christ pouring out his spirit. The book of Acts is going to chart that across um, to the ends of the world, ending up in Rome. And the story continues. God is still sp- send- pouring out his spirit, still sending his life-giving spirit, bringing dry bones to new life. And so we can be encouraged that uh, even though we do not see much fruit at the moment, we should not lose heart. The spirit producing fruit is what we're to expect, what we're to pray for. We can pray with confidence for this. It may be some time before we see that this happening, but we can pray with confidence and look for that fruit to be produced. Right, let's get to our passage then and see this work that the Holy Spirit does 
and loves to do. Three things I want to look at you, uh, look with you at this morning. Firstly, the Holy Spirit's means of working. The secondly, the Holy Spirit's message. And thirdly, the Holy Spirit's marks of new life. Firstly, the Holy Spirit's means. What are the, what's the means by which the Holy Spirit, as it were, rushes to get to work, having been poured out on this day of Pentecost? And the answer is, it's through the Word, the Word of God being spoken. The Spirit and the Word go together. We saw that, actually, uh, in Ezekiel 37. Prophesy to the bones, the prophet's told. Prophesy to the bones. And that's what Ezekiel does in this vision. And is it just the power of Ezekiel's words? No, it's the Spirit working through the prophesying of God's Word that produces life. And that's exactly what we see on this day of Pentecost. At that wonderful moment when the Holy Spirit is sent, there's an audible sound of a mighty wind, a violent wind, it says, and visibly he, the Holy Spirit, manifests himself as, quote, tongues of fire. Tongue, sorry, tongues as of fire. Verse 3. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now, there's surely some significance to these tongues as of fire, because tongues is mentioned in the very next verse as well. Verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, meaning other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I'm not at all thinking about the gift of tongues as as spoken of in 1 Corinthians. That's not what we're thinking about here. The point is that as the Holy Spirit is sent, he gives utterance. People speak. The Holy Spirit works through the word and he gives utterance. And the the utterance is described as tongues as of fire. Now, in fact, these people who who are given the Holy Spirit and as the Holy Spirit is distributed to them, um, they're, they're enabled to speak in different languages, aren't they? Supernaturally enabled to speak in different languages. And so that, um, verse 5, every nation under heaven who were represented there on, in Jerusalem at that feast, verse 6, each one of them hears them, the disciples of Jesus speak in their own language. Now that's surely a taste of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. And what the hearers say is, is described in verse 11. Sorry, what the hearers hear, what they, what they say with these tongues of fire is... Um, the people listening say, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. The point I'm making here is that the speech of these spirit-filled disciples wasn't just extraordinary for their sudden ability to speak in unlikely languages, these Galileans suddenly speaking in the language of Rome and of Persia and so on. No, there's more than that. This was a message on fire. This was a message about the mighty works of God. A proclamation of it. And so that's surely why the Spirit appears as tongues, as of fire. Because his work is to cause a message to be proclaimed as of fire. A fiery message. A glorious message. A powerful, burning message that goes forth and proclaims the mighty works of God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great preacher of the 20th century, spoke of preaching, the act of preaching, as logic on fire. And he would be the first to say, I know, that the on fire bit is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The means the Holy Spirit uses then is the the word going out, the preached word of God, and it goes out as a message on fire. That's That's what our nation needs, isn't it? That is what our nation needs pulpits where the mighty deeds of God are proclaimed with tongues as of fire. Street corners even where the mighty deeds of God are proclaimed with tongues as of fire. Well, may God's Spirit once again give utterance in that way as he did on the day of Pentecost. Secondly, let's look at the Holy Spirit's message. His means is is to give a message, is to preach a, a fiery message through the mouth of these disciples of Jesus. What is the message then? Well, verses 14 onwards records what the Holy Spirit gave utterance to Peter to say. 
And it fits very well, actually, with verse 11's description of this being a proclamation of the mighty works of God, or we might slightly broad, more broadly say the mighty wonders of God. Now, I don't just want to analyse Peter's speech, as it were, in the dissection lab, because that would be deathly for us all. What I want rather to do is to preach its contents. Verse 17, we are living in the last days. We are living in the last days. That the sending of the Holy Spirit into history, that day of Pentecost, brought in this era of gospel fruitfulness, as we've thought about a moment ago. It also brought in the final era of history, the final epoch of history, the history of this world. We're living in it. What does, what does that mean? Well, it means, verse 20, that the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord. And do you see how in verse 20, this day of the Lord is called a great and magnificent day? That's from Joel, that whole verses 17 to 21 are quoting. And the word in Joel in the original in, is literally, uh, could be translated, the great and fearsome day of the Lord. That phrase comes twice in Joel, the great and fearsome day. And in the other place that's not quoted here, Joel 2 verse 12, it says this. The day of the Lord is great and very awesome, very fearsome. Who can endure it? This is the key mighty work of God that the Holy Spirit desires and prompts to be proclaimed. There's a day coming that will be unendurable for mankind. This is intrinsic to the message the Holy Spirit would have preached to the ends of the earth. There is a day coming that will be unendurable for mankind. This is what salvation is all about. This is why we need to be saved. This is what we're doing, talking about salvation. This is what the Bible is talking about when it talks about salvation. There's a day coming of such dreadful judgment of God being poured out on mankind that Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 describes the people of the earth on that day as calling the mountains and the rocks to cover them, to hide them from the face of God and from the wrath of Christ. I can think of nothing worse, humanly speaking, I can think of nothing worse, no worse nightmare than being trapped underground. I don't know various things that you might think, I, I just do not want ever to experience that. Some people go potholing. I could never go potholing. I'd be terrified that I'd get stuck underground. That would be it. It's the stuff nightmares are made of. But the point is here that the people will seek even that fate to attempt to hide themselves from God's anger on that day that we need to be saved from. It's a day when all mankind's sins will come home to roost. And it's described as unendurable for anyone that will be found on that day with their sins still unforgiven. In actual fact, the mountains and the rocks will not be able to protect anyone on that day. I mean, what can shield a person from God when he comes to judge? The only thing that can shield us from God is God himself shielding us from God. And that's what the gospel is about. That there is a saviour. God sent to shield us from God. And so that is what the cross is all about. As Jesus goes there to shield us from the wrath of God by enduring the unendurable wrath of God himself in our place, in the place of the people that he came to save. I think there was a man, a true story, I think, a man who built himself a tomb. And he's, he's dead, he's in, his body's in this grave. And the tomb he built was made of concrete. And he, he, he specified that the concrete be really, really thick. And his reasoning for this was he did not want the judgment of God to be able to reach him. Can you believe it? I mean, God made a world where volcanoes erupt rocks and, and he made a world of galaxies and he made, he made the cosmos. What foolishness to think that God is held back by anything. There is only one saviour and that is God himself sent into this world, Jesus Christ, 
to rescue sinners by paying the penalty for them. There's no other saviour. You're looking in vain for anyone that will save you other than Christ to save you on that final day. Now let's look at one of the key roles that the Holy Spirit was sent for. And that's to convict people of sin. To convict people of sin and righteousness and judgment. It's in in John 16 verse 8 it says that. He will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, says Jesus. The Holy Spirit's now been sent and that's what he's doing. That's what we see in our passage. This is the gracious ministry of the Holy Spirit. To persuade people ahead of the judgment of God of what will happen if they keep going as they're living that they'll be utterly lost at the day of judgment if they've not fled to Christ. Now, did you notice, uh, there's vast swathes of our passage that I'm I'm, I'm sort of skating over this this morning, but did you notice how most of Peter's sermon is not devoted to salvation, but it's devoted to pressing home the need for salvation? And so he 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 proclaims the supremacy of Christ. He proclaims their sin in rejecting Christ. This is Jerusalem who had Christ crucified. And so Peter's sermon is largely about convicting, about confronting the people he's speaking to with their sin and proclaiming the lordship of God and the lordship of Christ and the great trouble that they are in if they do not repent and turn to Christ. And so, here we come to the third point then. We've seen the, uh, what have we seen? We've seen the means the Holy Spirit uses, the word. We've seen the message the Holy Spirit brings. And now we're moving on to the, the marks of new life as that message is responded to. This mighty message of the judgment of God unless you repent, unless you turn to Christ. And so let's see the, the marks of new life then in verse 37. Now when they, that's when the people Peter's speaking to, these these crowds of all sorts of people from all over the place, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, literally pierced to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? This is a vital mark of the new life that the Holy Spirit brings in a person's life, when he brings them life in Christ. One of the first things he will do is to convict people of their sin and make them feel not comfortable, not happy, but utterly undone, utterly exposed before God and concerned for their soul. And so can I ask you, if this mark of new life that we see here in verse 37, it's one of them, not the only one, but is this mark, do you recognize it in your own experience at all? Have you been reduced to such a state as these people are reduced to here in verse 37? Undone. What shall we do? Have you been convicted of the wretchedness of your sin and of of God's rightness to condemn you? How much we need the Spirit to bring us to this realization. It is a gracious work of the Holy Spirit and he brings us to this. Cut to the heart. Because how does the person ever truly seek salvation without it? From that springboard, as it were, a person whom the Spirit is working in will then put their trust in Jesus Christ and find comfort and find relief and find forgiveness and find reconciliation with God. We need the two things, these two marks of new life, being cut to the heart of our sin and coming to Christ in that state and finding salvation in him. Some of you maybe don't have one or both of those. I know some of you, not all of you. Some of you may have never experienced being cut to the heart at your sin, never experienced feeling utterly wretched before God, and from that, fleeing to Christ. Some of, you may ne- some of you have experienced that, but have not yet found relief in Christ. We need these two things. The Holy Spirit is wonderfully sent into this world to produce both of these marks of new life.
Let me move on to verse 38, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Verse 38. We better get to this bit, haven't we? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is where the balm of the gospel is applied to the wretched, open wounds that these people have uh, a, a feeling with, with their sin before God. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. This is the mighty wonders of God being proclaimed here. We've, got, we've had the mighty wonders of God coming to judge the world, and now we've got the mighty wonders that there is a Savior, and you need to flee to him and repent and turn and put your trust in Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And the promises, and some of you need to hear this, the promises for those who do, that there is complete forgiveness for your sins. Verse 38. There is the promise of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. This river of living water that will cleanse and sanctify you from within. There's the promise of that. And some of you have been Christ for many years. And if so, let today be a day of thanksgiving. That the Lord Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit and has worked in your life, the, the, the marks of, the, of new life that we've thought about this morning, that he's brought you to conviction of sin, that he's brought you to relief and salvation in Christ. And if that's the case, if that's you, then why not spend some time today on the Lord's Day meditating and worshipping God for what he's done? Because he's sent Christ to the cross for you. He's sent his spirit into the world for you. He's, he's, he's pursued you in love. He's worked in your heart and soul. So spend some time worshipping him, maybe singing even, or spend some time reading things that are helpful, reading God's word, reading helpful books. But for those who are still strangers to these marks of the new life that the Spirit brings, I would urge you, like we thought last Sunday, to seek these things with all your heart because God rewards those who seek him. Maybe some of you have experienced conviction of sin and yet you've not found relief in Christ. Seek that from the Lord. God doesn't say seek him in vain. He says seek him because he wants to answer that prayer. Some of you haven't yet experienced being cut to the heart at your sin. Seek that from the Lord. And he will reward those who seek him. So whatever your need, let's come to God. Let's seek these things. Let's seek the, the blessing that we've read about from our passage. Let's seek the Holy Spirit to be poured out in us and draw us to Christ. Whatever our need, whatever our state is, let's come to God in prayer then, shall we? Heavenly Father, we praise you that you've sent your spirit into this world. Well, thank you that you sent your spirit with a message on fire an alarming message of the unbearable, unendurable judgments of God that are coming. One of the supremacy of Christ who reigns, the one we've rejected, the God we've rejected is Lord. But thank you, Heavenly Father, that you produce conviction of sin in the hearts of those that you desire to save. Thank you for that gracious, unsettling of our soul until we find rest in Christ. Father, for anyone here who's not yet come to the, uh, the knowledge of their sins, who've not yet been confronted and, uh, and felt the offensiveness of, of their sins in your sight, bring them graciously to that point. For those who have but have not yet found relief in Christ, bring them through to that wonderful salvation as they trust in the Lord Jesus. And Father, for those in whom you've worked these things, may our hearts be filled with thanksgiving that you've produced the fruit of new life in us, that you've sent your spirit with such power and effect into our lives. So we pray these things then in Jesus' name. Amen.